these last few lectures, we've been talking about how we can build structured data with Racket. We've seen some examples of how we can build things like binary trees and lists and other arbitrarily kinds of tree-shaped data using Racket's S expressions. However, today we're going to talk about a few different facilities in Racket that are going to help us be able to do this much more uniformly. Right now, to build up structured data, we have to construct it using conses, lists, and appends. What we're going to talk about today is named pattern matching, which is a general technique for destructing various kinds of algebraic data. We're going to use pattern matching to help us build up predicates that help check different types and forms of things. All right, so I'd like to start us off by talking about quasi-quoting, which is a feature of Racket that's going to allow us to structurally build up expressions using this quasi-quote syntax here. So if I've got this quasi-quote, and note this uh, back tick is actually pronounced quasi-quote in Racket rather than just the regular tick, which is just regular quoted data. So this back tick is a quasi-quote, and then it's going to build up this S expression where we're going to splice in the definition of x right here because x has been unquoted. But everything else gets passed through. So for example, we've got y here, that gets passed through just as if it were quoted. And a regular literal, like tick y, if it's not unquoted, is just equivalent to regular symbol tick y. All right, so in general, if we have a quasi-quote, what we're going to have is we're going to have some expression where we've got a quasi-quote, starts with this back tick, and then we've got a list of things, building uh, using parentheses, and then we're going to have potentially unquoted data within that list. So what Racket's going to do is it's going to substitute, it's going to reconstitute this list, but it's going to splice in, uh, it's going to evaluate that value in Racket before it, uh, before it actually splices in the value. I'll also point out that this works at multiple different levels. So this allows you to build lists within lists. And this is going to be helpful for building nested data when we manipulate things like syntax of programming languages. So for example, consider this uh, quasi-quoted data here. So I've got quasi-quote square. And then I've got a sublist who's tagged as point, and then we unquote x0, and then unquote y0. And then the second sublist here in square unquotes x1, and then unquotes y1. All right, so that builds up an expression like this. So let's pull this into, uh, let's pull this into racket. All right, so defining x0 and x1 and y0 and y1 appropriately, if I drop them in using this unquote syntax here, they get wrapped up with this square tag. I get 0 0.01, and then I get 0 0.12 because of my x1 and y1. So that's what this looks like in Racket. All right, and I can also unquote arbitrary expressions, so they don't just have to be variables. So right here, I unquoted x0 and y0, but right here in point, I unquote plus 1x0. And so that will drop in to first evaluate plus 1x0. Let's say x0 is 1, then this would evaluate to 2. And then the second expression here will evaluate to minus 1y0. It'll drop that in. So you could put any arbitrary function call right here or any really uh, any expression right here as well. All right, so let's, now let's do an exercise. The exercise says, Define make point and make square using quasi quotation. So they've given us the uh, normal definitions of make point and make square right here. So let's copy those over into, uh, into Dr. Racket. All right, so we've copied over our definitions of make point and make square. And now let's start coding up versions of these that just use Racket's quasi quotation. So I'm going to call this one make point again. And it's going to accept arguments x and y just like normal. And I can see now previously I used the list function. I passed it the tick point, so to, uh, to the make a symbol of a point. But here I'm going to use quasi quotes. And so I don't have to quote point now. But I have to unquote x and y. So when I use quasi quote, I just kind of sort of, you can see it as sort of factoring the uh, quote across the different things inside of the list. And so I sort of, I get point quoted. But then x and y, if I want them unquoted, I drop in the uh, unquote character, so comma. 
Now to define make square again, I'm gonna use quasi quoting. It's gonna be very similar, same, same kind of structure. So I'm gonna do a, a quote square, and then I'll unquote PT0 and PT1. All right, so now let's run it and see what happens. And I'm gonna do make square again. I'm gonna pass point zero 0.01 and then point uh, 0.12. All right, and I see I get out a square, point zero 0.01, point uh, 0.12. All right, so now I wanna to talk to you about my favorite feature of Racket. This is actually the main reason I use Racket. I think if you program in Racket using the normal SICP style, I actually don't think it's that great of a language. It seems really, really annoying to always have to use cons and lists to build up these data structures. So the feature that I use all the time is pattern matching with quasi patterns. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about now. And it's gonna be the basis for a whole bunch of the kinds of programming we're gonna do in this course. All right, so here's what a match pattern actually looks like. It starts with the word match, and then there's an expression you want to actually match on. And this expression could be arbitrarily complex. It doesn't just have to be a variable. It could be a call site or something like that. All right, and then there's going to be a set of match patterns. All right, we'll discuss what those match patterns are in a while. There are gonna be a bunch of them that I'll sort of show you and you can kind of look them up. But we'll talk about them. They're just going to provide the patterns which are going to be checked against E. So you're gonna first evaluate E, you're gonna check all of the different patterns in order, and then this is the crucial part, you're going to execute the first body that fires and return whatever it evaluates to as the entire value of the match. Even if there are potential other patterns that might match later on, the first pattern that you get to that matches is going to be the one that fires and executes. All right, so this is a really key thing that, that students frequently get tripped up on. All right, so many patterns, lots of them, we're gonna talk about what the different kinds of patterns are gonna be. The patterns are checked in order. The first matching patterns body is executed. And again, later bodies will not be executed, even if they also match. And it, I think it's worth pointing out, I frequently see students make this mistake. So be very thoughtful about the order of your match statements. It is one of the few things that uh, is, is pretty easy to get tripped up on. Usually they're going to be disjoint, but sometimes they might overlap and it's very crucial to, to take into account when that might happen. All right, so let's look at our first example. So we've got this match statement right here and we've got this uh, list one, two, three, and then we're matching it against two separate pa match patterns and we've got two separate bodies, all right? The first match pattern matches a list where you can have two elements in that list and we're saying the first element of that list is going to be bound as the variable A. The second variable of that list is going to be bound as the value B. And we're going to return the value B. Now the second match pattern is a con cell. The first element of that con cell is A. The second element of that con cell is B. This is what the match pattern syntax looks like for con cells. Whenever there's a dot in the middle, that means match a con cell with some left element and some right element this is going to return B. All right, so in this case, what are we going to get? We're going to be matching a con cell against this list right here. So let's see, does the first pattern fire? Well, the first pattern can't fire because this would match a list of precisely two elements, but this has three elements in its uh, list. And so instead, we're going to match this second match pattern because a list is a con cell. And so we're going to match the first element of that list as A, and then the rest of the list, the cutter, as the list 2, 3. And we're going to return 2, 3 from the entire match form right here. All right, now let's look at another example. So I've got this match up here with matching against E, and we have a whole bunch of different match patterns we're going to check. So let's just walk through them one by one. We'll explain what each one of them does. So the first is going to match a literal symbol. So we're matching the literal symbol hello, we're saying when that happens, we're gonna return tick goodbye, so the symbol goodbye. The next one we're gonna match is a predicate. So that starts with a question mark, and then we're going to have a predicate we're going to check against the thing we're matching. So number ha huh, gets applied to E, or more precisely, whatever E evaluates to. And then if it matches, that result is bound as in, which can then be used in the body. Now, 
The next case is also a predicate match. However, I want to point out it's never going to fire, and it's subsumed by the previous case. Anything that's a non-negative integer ha huh, is also a number ha. Huh? And remember, because the matches are always checked in order, if something is non-negative integer ha, huh, well, it's always going to have fired this branch right here. And so you'll never get to this match case. This match body will never be executed because it's subsumed by this previous case. Now, on the last slide, we saw a version of how we can match conses using the quasi-pattern syntax. So that looks like this. You want to match a cons cell, you have open parentheses, and then you have a dot, and then you have a pattern on the left and the pattern on the right. So you might not use that too much, but you can also match literally using the word cons, and then you can bind patterns here, x and y. And note that if you here wanted to match the literal x, you would actually have to quote it. All right, now the last one is probably the one we're gonna use most frequently. This one is a quasi-pattern. Quasi-patterns begin with a back tick, and then they have an open parentheses, and they have a list of some length, and in that list, you can specify unquoted variables that get bound, which can then be used in the body. So this here is a quasi-pattern that will match a list of length three, will bind a0, a1, and a2, and will then return the sum of the last two elements of that list. Now note you can also have quasi-patterns that return or that use other patterns. So here, for example, this matches a list of length two, where the first element of the list is bound as x and satisfies non-negative integer, ha, huh? And the second element of the list is a positive, ha. Huh? So I should also point out, you can have a default case as well. You do that by having a wildcard. Wildcard will match anything, no matter what. And so once you have a wildcard here, no other statements will ever fire because this will subsume everything down below. So you always want to put this at the very end if you do have it. Sometimes you don't even want it, but sometimes you do. All right, so now let's work through an example. Our exercise tells us to define a function foo that returns twice its argument if its argument is a number, huh? Returns the first two elements of a list if its argument is a list of length three, or the string error if it is anything else. All right, so let's copy and paste this over. All right, so now we're gonna code up foo and racket. I've pasted the requirements up here. So we're saying we need to define a function foo that returns twice its argument if its argument is a number, ha. Huh? So we need to start out, and we're gonna start out by using a match statement to do this. So we're gonna practice how we use match to do this. We're gonna match x, our argument, and now we're gonna use a predicate match pattern. And those begin with a open parentheses and then a question mark to say we want to check a predicate against that value x. All right, so we're going to do question mark, and then number, huh? That's going to check x to see if it's a number, and then we're going to bind in. And then we're going to say, when this body fires, we're going to return two times in. All right? So now let's think about how we might do the next one. All, All right, right, so how, how could I do this second case here? So I need to return the first two elements if the argument is a list of length three. So I could use the same approach I took. Ultimately, I'm going to want us to use quasi-patterns, but let's say we wanted to use the same uh, predicate-based approach we just had. Well, then we could have list of length three, huh? Uh, and then L, and then we could do take um, L two. So take is a function that will take as many uh, so let's do something like 0, 1, 2, 3, and then 2. Take will return as many as we specify here. All right, so we can use this function take. Um, but now we need a definition for list of length 3, huh? So I could write it. So I could say define list of length 3, huh? L, and I could say and um, equal length L. Well, first I'd want to say list ha l equal l length l3. All right, uh, so I could do that. 
But ultimately, I'm only going to use this function once, and so it's kind of easier for me to write it in one line by using a lambda, since we're immediately going to apply this. And so I could write lambda x and list ha huh, x equal length x3. So that's the first way I could do it. And then I could say anything else is going to be the string error. All right, so let's run this code and see what happens. So let's do foo of three, foo of negative two. Okay, how about foo of um, just the empty list, or sorry, foo of the list containing zero, so that's error. How about foo containing zero, zero? That's error. How about foo containing one, two, zero? That's just one, two. All right, so it looks like we got the right behavior. The first two elements of the list, if it's argument is a list of length three, what about foo one, two, three, four? All right, and we get an error, all right, because it's larger than less three. All right, now how could we rewrite this to use quasi patterns? Um, so if we're matching things that are going to be list-like, it's actually a lot more helpful and you should really get into the habit of using quasi patterns, if only because it's what I'm always going to do in the rest of this class. So if you don't get used to this syntax, it's gonna just be kind of hard to read the rest of the things like interpreters and compilers as we go later on. So try to get used to this now. So we can match a list of length three by doing quasi pattern, and then uh, we can do x0, x1, and x2. So that matches a list of length three, it binds x0 is the first element, x1 is the second element, and x2 is the third element. And remember, we need these we need these unquotes here, these commas. If we don't have these commas, it's just gonna literally match the symbol x2. Let's see what happens with that in a second. But then how would we rebuild the list containing x0 and x1? Well, right here, we could just do x0 and x1. So kind of note the duality between quasi patterns on the left and then quasi, uh, quasi quotes on the right. So here I'm matching data, and then over here I'm returning and I'm building data. So I'm saying match and bind x0, x1, and x2, and then build up this list containing x0 and x1. I'm splicing their definitions in because I'm using commas to unquote. Now, Racket is a dynamically typed language. Unlike languages like Haskell that are statically typed, there's no static checks to tell you when you might have messed up interacting with data in some way. So you can't know, for example, in Racket whether your matches are even total or not. Because of that, I'm frequently going to advocate that we use this pattern that I'm going to call type predicates. Now a type predicate is just a predicate that specifies a data format by using a match statement and returns either true or false. All right, so here I've got this predicate tree, huh? That's going to match a piece of data and tell me whether it looks like what I'm going to call a tree. So I'm saying allowable trees are going to match tick empty and then a leaf where I've got some value here. I don't constrain what the value is. They can also be binary nodes where I have two subtrees. And note, I didn't label these subtrees T0 or T1, although I could do that if I wanted to. I could bind them, but because I don't use them, I just check that they're tree has, then I don't bind them right here. And then also point out that Anything that doesn't satisfy these predicates, I want to return false. And if I don't do this, this is going to lead to match failures, which will crop up as dynamic errors. All right? So you usually want to avoid that. You usually want to return false right here. All right? Now, I'd like to wrap up lecture today by offering you a little bit of advice about how you might get a little bit of this static checking or at least uh, structured checking back in your programming. So even though Racket doesn't have a static type system, it does have what is called a contract system. This contract system will dynamically check properties of values as they flow through the program and make sure that they fit certain invariants that you specify. You can use this define slash contract form to annotate a contract on top of a function. And so if I have this function here, tree min, I might say it accepts a tree, huh? And it produces any kind of a value. All right, I could constrain this further. I might say something like a number, huh? But because I don't know precisely what values are in trees, I'm going to say this could be any value. 
Now note, I use this arrow constructor here to say, I've got a function that accepts one argument, treeha, and then returns an any slash c, which is just how you say a contract that matches any value. Now, I'll let you dig into the racket define contract form a little bit more on your own if you're seriously interested in using it. Uh, you can also write, if you have multi-argument functions here like t0 and t1, you could have something like multiple arguments to the uh, contract right here. Although in this case, we're not going to do that. But you can sort of see how um, this might work and how you might use this. And we can sort of see here when we're applying this to this example tree min, I have this correctly structured tree, and so I get this nice answer. Now, if you uh, see in Racket here, I'm going to play around with this definition of tree min. I can see I have this normal uh, behavior here where I throw empty at it, and I just get this error back. All right, now I pass to tree min a leaf containing the value 2, but I didn't quote it, so I need to be careful to make sure that I put a quote in front of it. All right. That'll make it structured data, and I can pass that in. All right, note here that sometimes Racket actually does have these structured types you can define using struct. We're mostly not going to do that in this course, but if you were using structured types, you would be making this call like we had seen up here, with just regular uh, call to leaf and then two. All right, so now let's try checking out some other stuff. So let's try calling uh, something with like a binary, leaf 23, and then uh, leaf 46. Of course, here I made the same mistake. So I just want to point out, this is something that uh, students will frequently get wrong. You need to be very careful with this. I even make the same mistake myself. So make sure to quote the data, binary, leaf 23, and then leaf 46. All right, so now let's see what happens when I throw at this tree-like thing. But it isn't quite a tree because trees have to have trees on their left sides where here I'm just putting two. So this isn't really a valid tree. Let's see what's gonna happen. So I'm gonna call this function, and now Dr. Racket is gonna yell at me. It's gonna tell me tree min has a contract violation. It expected a tree ha huh, in the first argument of this function, and it's blaming this anonymous unsaved editor module. That's the REPL that we're typing in. It's blaming this, this buffer. All right, so it's saying that's the source of the error. So it'll give you a notion of who is to blame when you have a function. It'll tell you whether it's the function's fault or whether it's your fault for calling it. All right, well, that's gonna wrap up our coverage of quasi-patterns and quasi-quoting. I'm going to assume that you know this material as we go throughout the course, and mostly I'll make use of quasi-patterns pretty heavily, especially when we do things like write interpreters and compilers. So if you don't have this material down, please do ask questions during class.